Good afternoon. Yeah, yes, Buenos Aires. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's uh, that's I know. <laughs> yes. uh, my name is Yasuhiko Genko Kimura. Uh, I'm from Japan. Now I live in, in 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 the United States. I'm a Zen Buddhist priest and a philosopher. Uh, three, actually f five years ago, uh, my dear friend Rafael and I uh, founded uh, BFF, B Future Forum, along with uh, our dear friend Alec Oxenford. Now, BFF, as you know, stands for Best Friend Forever. <laughs> <laughs> and we are, in fact, Best Friends Forever. Now, B, in future, uh, so I, let me just uh, go over a, a little bit about this B Future Forum. So B Future Forum is a forum for sustained future creating conversations from future. Some of you may have heard uh, a quote from Mahatma Gandhi that says, be the change that you want to make. Also, there was a uh, great uh, visionary inventor from uh, America, Buckminster Fuller. He said, the best way to predict the future is to design it. So our intention is to have a sustained, ongoing, future-creating conversations by being not only in the future, but the possibility that is the future. Many of you know uh, Apple has the slogan, think different. In order for you to think different, you need to be different. So we are having this ongoing conversation to create a future by placing ourselves in a different place <coughs> of our imagination and create the future from the future. So. Um, Today and the next two days, we are meeting in this beautiful uh, Buenos Aires, having this future creating conversations. And uh, in conjunction with the Arteba, we want to focus our conversation more on the art but you cannot really separate art from technology, science, and actually philosophy. I invented the term techno art science. In fact, that may be the future of science, art, and technology. So before we start our discussion, uh, I would like my colleague to introduce themselves briefly, and then we will start the discussion.
caso creando la iniciativa de Planning to Form, que es una iniciativa reflexiva, eh, en este caso del pensamiento del futuro de la humanidad. Eh, después retomaré aquí y hablaremos más. Gracias. Alec. Mi nombre es Alec Oxenford, soy, creo que tu cosa no andaba. Eh, soy presidente de, de Arte Va, estoy muy contento de estar acá con ustedes hoy y también soy miembro del, del Be Future Forum. Soy entrepreneur, me fundé la remate, OLX y Let Go hace poco y me divierte mucho tener esta conversación sobre dos mundos que me apasionan, que son el de la tecnología y, y el del arte. Y como decía Sugio, creo que están muy mezclados y de maneras a veces no, no obvias. Así que, bueno, gracias por estar acá. Uh, my name is Fred Turner, and um, I'm a poet. Uh, I was uh, born in England and um, raised in Central Africa by my parents who were anthropologists. Um, some of you may have heard of Victor Turner, um, who studied uh, ritual, uh, human ritual. And um, I was educated at Oxford University and I'm very honored to be here. I'm a professor at the School of Arts and Humanities in the University of Texas at Dallas. Um, and I'm, uh, as I say, I, I, these colleagues here of mine are simply astonishing me. And, and this city is so beautiful. Yeah, hello, my name is Enrico Bauer. I'm from Switzerland and the uh, first time here in Argentina, in Buenos Aires. I have learned that I have relatives here from my Italian side. So if one of you is part of that family, please <laughs> let me know. <laughs> oh, okay, found one. Uh, I'm interested in art. I had an own art gallery. Uh, I'm a collector of art. I'm an engineer, I'm a business consultant, and I have founded about 15 companies. And I'm very interested in spirituality and the relation to art, technology, and the development of our society in a sustainable way. So, um we are going to uh, open this uh, discussion. Um, in the Future Forum, when we talk about the future of technology and art, or art and technology, we approach this from the perspective of the evolution of consciousness. You just can imagine the art and technology and science forming a triple helix evolving if we are left behind, there will be a huge problem <laughs> in, in society. So you, you would like to see the human consciousness also evolve. And if the human consciousness evolve, what kind of technology and art and science humanity may be able to create? And in that uh, context, I would like to ask my, uh, my colleague, two questions. They are very similar, but fundamentally different. The, the first question is, what the future holds for art? Second question is, what art holds for future? So what art holds for the future means that there is a tremendous possibility that is inherent in art, yes? Given that possibility, what kind of future that art holds? But then beyond art, there's a range of possibilities that are available for humanity. In the context of that possibility, that future, what that future holds for the art? And they are a little bit different questions, yeah? And uh, my colleague can answer either questions or both questions. And then 
we want to open this space for all of you to discuss and think together. As I said, I'm a philosopher, and our job is to think and make people think. So our intention is for you to think together with us so that uh, you start to sweat in your head. <laughs> and by the time we leave this place, our intention is to, for all of us, have a new insight. Yes, OK, so. You're Raphael. Light, I can't yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, you see too much light from uh, my head. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I can't help being enlightened. <laughs> Can I see that? Um, yes. Um, uh, well, let, I'll, I'll stand. Yes. Um, maybe a little bit of history. Yes. Um, uh, some ages, some, some periods, um, break the shackles of the past to create the future. But there are some periods that break the shackles of the present to create the future. Sometimes we, re we recover our capacity for art by going back to the past. That's what the Renaissance did. That's what um, uh, uh, how can I put it? We live on the surface of the present. The future is what we're going to make. The, the world is expanding into a space that we can do anything with. The only thing, the only resource we have is where we've been already. The only, the, 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 the materials for making art are the, are, are the materials of the past. And I want to give, a, 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 to give an example from, um, uh, the, the great poet of England, uh, William Shakespeare. I could have chosen Cervantes, I could have chosen Dante, I could have uh, chosen um, uh, uh, Goethe, the great German poet. But let me uh, talk a little bit about Shakespeare. Here we have somebody who is making an entirely new kind of drama. He's making a new kind of poetry, um, revolutionizing uh, drama. There were people who said, you know, Shakespeare wasn't making real tragedy because it was different from Aristotle's tragedy. But now we recognize that Shakespeare's tragedy is in a sense more tragedy even than Aristotle's tragedy. Um, so how did, he do, how did he do this? Shakespeare was making the future, but he was, he was using old forms. He was bringing in new form, uh, bringing in old forms. His uh, his sonnets, um, he borrowed the, so the sonnet form from, from Petrarch, um, the, the Italian poet, a, a hundred years, more than a hundred years before. Uh, he, uh, he turned it to new, use, uh, to, uh, to, to new uses. Um, right now, we're living in a period where we've, where for a hundred years, really since Dada, since, since Dada, we have been systematically questioning all of our old forms of art, all of our old ideas about art. We, we said, well, d does painting have to paint pictures of things? Maybe we should make abstract paintings. We said, um, does poetry have to have meter and rhyme and, and stanza and all of those forms? Um, uh, we, we said, um, uh, do actors do, 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 uh, should actors be um, making the audience sympathize with them Brecht says no we should have an alienation effect Verfremdung's effect you know that the, that the audience shouldn't be uh, allowed to uh, identify with the, with, with the character uh, we in music we went away from tonality and we went into the 12 tone row well that is a kind of tonality but then then you end up with Stockhausen and Cage and so on these were really important questions 
But maybe one of the things that we were doing was breaking something down so that we could re so, so that we could rebuild it. Um, I, I want to uh, let me. I want to recite a uh, a sonnet of Shakespeare, and this is Shakespeare using an old form and t making it absolutely new. So here it goes. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, as it does now, and often <laughs> is his gold com complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometimes declines by chance or nature's changing hand untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can s s s men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. So he's using this old form and giving it new life. And I think in the next, uh, I see in the next uh, 50 years, the next 100 years, I see that we're going to recover all of those arts of beauty. We're going to recover the idea of beauty, but having been through all the questioning that it needed to have gone through. Thank you. Well, I'm glad I'm not a translator. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but I'm sure it came over very well in Spanish as well. Well, if we go back to the origins of art, you may recall some of the paintings that our predecessors 30, 40,000 years ago have left in the caves, like images of hands, then art was not a separate thing from everyday life. You couldn't buy the cave or the artwork and sell it uh, or do something crazy with it. It was just a part of an expression of life. Art was a means to an end, a means to progress, to expand consciousness, to expand the understanding of humanity. And now we are at the point where we realize that art should maybe rediscover that in innate function and not be externalized as a material, materialistic uh, development just for the sake of investment for the sake of uh, concepts and in that sense I think the future for art will be a rediscovery of the art in its original view and its original function closely connected to the hearts of people to the communities to science nowadays to technology and art has the potential to bring that all together and to help humanity to grow and to further develop and art, in that sense, understand in this original form, uh, will bring us a new future, which is more playful, more explorative. Uh, also, it will uh, solve problems which we can't solve from the point of view where we have created them, even problems of sustainability, of war, whatever we encounter in this world. Art is a means to reconnect to our pure essence and being. Thank you.
tecnologías, pero que al mismo tiempo todas estas tecnologías nos ofrecen desafíos importantes. Y en las disrupciones que existen en el mundo del pensamiento, en el mundo de la vida social y política del, de, que vivimos en la Argentina, pero también en el mundo en general. Y queremos analizar cómo estas disrupciones importantes pueden servirnos, tal vez, para ir en busca de un mundo eh, que sea evolutivo en el sentido positivo eh, de la evolución. Y en ese sentido, eh, algunas observaciones que estamos analizando en estos días, sobre todo que vemos a la tecnología, de ellos son por lo menos dos. Una, eh, el hecho de que desde la época de Newton y de Cartes eh, hemos mecanizado nuestro modelo de pensamiento y nos hemos tornado cada vez más sociedades donde los individuos se especializaron en una cosa sola. O soy un artista, o soy un eh, médico, o soy un técnico, o soy un filósofo, etc. Y dentro de la medicina me tengo que especializar entonces en nariz, garganta y oído, y dentro de esto me especializo en nariz, y dentro de la nariz me especializo en la nariz izquierda, y por ahí va. Entonces eh, perdemos, los seres humanos, la visión holística, perdemos nuestro sentido de la racionalidad. Cuando digo racionalidad, una cosa es tener una lógica y ser inteligente en algo específico, y otra es saber si esto que estamos haciendo hace sentido no solo para nosotros ahora, pero para nosotros como seres evolutivos, para la sociedad en la que vivimos, para el mundo que habitamos, para el universo y para el futuro. Y en ese sentido me parece que es importante que volvamos a integrarnos como seres humanos y que, y que o sea, podamos desarrollar dentro de nosotros todos los ámbitos eh, que son importante es ser desarrollado en el ámbito cognitivo, en el ámbito emocional, en el ámbito intelectual y en el ámbito espiritual. El otro elemento es la desconexión que también hemos tenido en los últimos siglos de, eh, de, de lo que vivimos en el plano real, material, terreno y de, nuestra, eh, de nuestro ambiente espiritual, porque en última esencia somos seres espirituales estamos tal vez muy desconectados de esto y esto nos lleva a un riesgo importante al riesgo de ejercer en el plano político, en el plano económico en el plano de los negocios en el plano de la vida, tal vez funciones y tomar decisiones que no estén alineadas necesariamente con, eh, con nuestros planos superiores por decirlo de alguna forma en mi caso particular tuve una experiencia interesante de vida en la cual eh, por suerte he podido ir atrás de mis curiosidades en la vida y hoy en día soy al mismo tiempo presidente de una empresa grande de tecnología en América Latina, Qualcomm, que es un líder mundial en tecnología celular. También soy actor de teatro, de una pieza que está en cartelera, dos, otras dos que estoy preparando ahora, una como autor, otra como co-dramaturgo. Creé eh, también el Festival de Teatro en el Brasil, que hoy es el mayor que existe, el MITCP. Creamos hace dos años una escuela, de, la primera escuela en América Latina, Universidad de Artes Creativas. Soy inversor en muchas startups, empresas y al mismo tiempo trabajo en el mundo del pensamiento con Díaz Unico, por ejemplo, en este IFF. Entonces, con esto doy el ejemplo de que es posible eh, hoy en día, por las necesidades, urgencias que tenemos, poder, además de una familia, me está presente con tres hijas y de una vida también privada es decir, es posible hacer todo esto y de alguna forma compatibilizarlo y si, y, y si quiero referirme entonces por último a los desafíos de esto yo lo he conseguido pero eh, tal vez me costó muchos años eh, antes de llegar hasta ahí ¿por qué no pensar que todos los chicos que están siendo educados en la escuela o que están creciendo en sus familias o en la sociedad tengan la posibilidad también de aprender a colocarse como personas holísticas que exploren todas las facetas de su vida, eh, como dije, el plano cognitivo, el plano emocional, el plano intelectual, el plano espiritual y otros planos, el plano físico, etc., eh, al mismo tiempo y en armonía y en equilibrio. Y la otra es eh, cómo podemos hacer para realmente reconectarnos y 
esto también pasa por la educación y ciertamente por la cultura a eh, nuestra, eh, nuestro origen mayor que es el mundo espiritual como seres espirituales que son. Muchas gracias. gracias. Bueno, no, no voy a ni tratar de competir con filósofos y pensadores y poetas y demás, así que voy a ir a algunos comentarios un poco más eh, del presente y terrenales, pero que son, creo, interesantes para ayudarnos a reflexionar. Creo que hay varias cosas que están pasando en términos de la evolución de la tecnología y el arte. Eh, la primera que me gustaría comentar es que la tecnología nos está ayudando a entender el arte del pasado que es muy relevante porque es nuestro arte. Nosotros somos el producto acumulado de toda la historia infinita para atrás del pasado. Eso somos nosotros hoy. En la medida que entendamos eso, vamos a tener un mejor futuro que va a ser un mejor presente en algún momento. La tecnología hoy, por ejemplo, nos permite entender cómo era el arte hace 500 años, 1000 años o 2000 años, mucho mejor que lo entendían muy poco tiempo después de haber sido creado ese arte en ese momento. Por ejemplo, el Getty Foundation en Estados Unidos, a través de mecanismos que van de carbono 14 a eh, otras técnicas, puede hoy recrear pinturas y obras de arte antiguas y hacerlas que se luzcan hoy como verdaderamente eran en el momento en que fueron creadas. Casi todo lo que nosotros vemos que es arte antiguo no se ve como se veía en ese momento, se ve muy distinto está influido eh, por eh, el paso del tiempo, por la luz, todos sabemos lo que pasa con una pintura si la ponemos medio, <risa> medio año a la luz. Bueno, imaginémonos lo que pasa con pinturas que tienen 500 o 800 años. Por un lado eso, nos va, vamos a poder entender mucho mejor el arte del pasado, vamos a revisitar y recrear el arte del pasado usando la tecnología para entenderlo y eso nos va a cambiar el arte de hoy. Otro cambio muy importante que está produciendo la tecnología tiene que ver con la velocidad de lo que es el ciclo creativo del arte. Históricamente, y por los últimos ciento y pico de años, el ciclo del arte pasaba por eh, un artista producía su arte, si tenía suerte, ese arte producido iba a parar a una exhibición en una galería, si de verdad era muy bueno, eh, terminaba una bienal. Pasaba de una exhibición mensual a una bienal eh, después de haber sido creados, pero esto es para un grupo muy chiquitito de artistas, los, los más reconocidos. En paralelo a eso teníamos el, los periódicos que a su vez publicaban, eh, si, si tenía suerte, noticias sobre este arte, alguna revista mensual y por ahí alguna publicación anual. Sin embargo, ¿qué es lo que pasa hoy? Un artista produce una obra de arte, la puede producir, mostrar en su teléfono, en su iPhone o el teléfono que fuera, instantáneamente la publica y se distribuye inmediatamente a miles de personas. Esto no había pasado nunca. Ahora, esto tiene un montón de implicaciones, porque lo que empieza a pasar, lo que se empieza a ver, es que los artistas empiezan a producir arte entendiendo que lo que va a pasar es que ese arte va a ser analizado, evaluado y tal vez comprado a través de una pantalla de este tamaño. Bueno, cuando yo entiendo eso, y si mi objetivo es comercial, que en parte es el de muchos artistas porque necesitan sobrevivir, eso limita mucho la producción del arte, porque necesitan diseñar, producir arte que es atractivo para una pantalla de este tamaño. Y eso genera un montón de... Eh, tiene un montón de implicaciones en lo que va a ser la calidad del arte hacia adelante. Otro punto importante tiene que ver con... Eh, los procesos de filtrado y eh, depuración de toda la producción artística. Eh, como en cualquier actividad, existe arte de mala calidad, de buena calidad y de excelente calidad. Y lo mismo pasa con cualquier actividad humana. Hay edificios eh, con arquitectura genial y edificios mediocres. Y lo mismo pasa con la comida, una silla o lo que querramos. Durante algunos siglos, definitivamente después del Renacimiento, existieron filtros que de alguna manera, a veces mejor, a veces peor, trataban de separar el arte de mayor calidad del arte de menor calidad. Y aparecen galerías que filtran a todos los artistas que quieren presentar en galerías y después aparecen curadores que deciden 
quién pasa al siguiente nivel y aparecen museos y aparecen críticos y pasa el tiempo y otros críticos, etcétera, etcétera. Bueno, todo ese proceso de feedback que genera que el arte que se va produciendo con el paso del tiempo se vaya depurando y lo que termina siendo, entre comillas, masificado sea, entre comillas, lo, lo más filtrado, desaparece o está en términos de desaparecer eh, en este momento donde ese feedback que reciben los artistas ya no pasa por una secuencia escalonada de artistas especializados y de, perdón, de expertos especializados que van opinando sobre el arte, sino que es un feedback directo de la gente. Alguien publica eh, algo en Instagram o lo que sea, recibe más likes que el otro y la interpretación es que esto es mejor que lo otro y el, el camino va por allá. Esa desintermediación de expertos en el mundo del arte creo que también es relevante y está recién empezando. Yo me puedo imaginar hacia adelante esto pasando con un impacto importante. Esos tres efectos, el entender mejor el pasado usando tecnología para poder ver hoy de verdad lo que fue el arte real históricamente en el pasado nuestro. La velocidad a la que eh, pasamos por eh, los ciclos de, de básicamente broadcasting del arte, desde la producción hasta que básicamente se consagra un artista. Y la eliminación de intermediarios que decíamos recién, creo que va a generar un arte muy nuevo y bastante distinto a lo que vemos hoy. Yo no sé cómo va a ser y creo que eso lo iremos descubriendo con el tiempo. No sé cuál de las realidades posibles se va a dar, pero sospecho que estos tres cambios que son muy fundamentales van a generar un arte muy distinto, probablemente mucho más efímero, probablemente en algunos escenarios más superficial. Vamos a ver. La realidad muchas veces nos sorprende, aparecen quiebres y, nos, y de repente aparece algo nuevo. Pero creo que son preguntas que, que nos podríamos hacer. A mí me gustaría abrirlo a las preguntas de, de ustedes ahora. Gracias. So, uh, let's open this conversation to the whole, whole group. And, uh, do you have any... Yes, please. Sí, una pregunta sobre, bueno, la, vos hablaste de una triple hélica de arte, tecnología y ciencia, pero me parece que falta y un poco, o sea, se habló de eso, industria cultural. O sea, no creo que podemos ser tan ingenuos y tan naif como para pensar que en esta mediación entre los tres actores, industria cultural sea simplemente una interfaz y no un actor uh, a su vez. Y no, yo no estoy tan segura que industria cultural está desapareciendo. ¿Por qué? Eh, por las redes sociales. Porque, por ejemplo, en el mundo editorial, que conozco un poquito mejor, eh, los jóvenes escritores publican en Wattpad y los, las editoriales están como, como aves de rapiña, eh, escaneando la, estas plataformas para buscar el, el talento o algo que pueda ser de éxito, con resultados que son más o menos, depende, pero como dependía de, desde antes. Así que eh, yo no, no, sé, no, no sé cuánto la industria cultural va a transformarse en un simple interfaz en lugar de, ser, de seguir siendo un actor. No, yo tampoco sé. Yo, yo estaba simplemente eh, describiendo datos de hoy que pueden tener influencia fuerte en el futuro. Yo, yo no sé cómo va a ser. Eh, eh, pero es, es una realidad que hoy la gente dedica eh, eh, entre 3 y 4 horas del día a conectarse y a básicamente mirar imágenes en social media que no pasó nunca antes. Esas tres o cuatro horas es más que lo que usan para leer, para visitar eh, bibliografía, para etcétera. O sea, es una fuente eh, de información fundamental y está reemplazando a todas las demás. La lectura de diarios ha caído al 20%, de lo que, o sea, cayó 80% en relación a lo que fue en el pico. Lo mismo con la mayoría de las revistas especializadas, etcétera. Entonces, es un fenómeno que se está dando. Yo no sé cómo termina la historia. Pero eso es lo que estoy comentando, sí. Tal vez complementando, parece que la industria cultural o la cultura en sí es tan importante cuanto la educación si queremos transformar a la sociedad o ayudar a que evolucione. Eh, creo que tenemos una gran oportunidad 
para la industria cultural, que es el hecho de que la tecnología nos va a dar la chance de, eh, si querés, liberarnos de muchas de las cosas que hacemos hoy y que son más rutinarias y repetitivas. La inteligencia artificial nos va a liberar de todo lo que es, gran parte de lo que se trabaja en la inteligencia analítica. Sí, mucha gente que trabajó bien eso, va a tener que buscar otras formas de trabajo, pero en general siempre ha, ha habido reciclajes en la sociedad y vamos a encontrar otra forma de, de ganar dinero. Lo que es cierto es que vamos a tener posiblemente más tiempo y si tenemos más tiempo podríamos también consumir más cultura, crear, consumir más cultura. El peligro es, bueno, pero vamos hacia allá o vamos a banalizarnos, trivializarnos y es para un entretenimiento barato o para que simplemente nos quedemos pegados a una pantalla el día entero sin hacer nada y esclavizarnos con eso. Esto depende también de, eh, de educación, de cultura, de política cultural adecuada, de agentes culturales eh, adecuados y de llevar una sociedad que nos lleve a hacer buen uso del tiempo que tengamos en el futuro. Eh, hola, eh, Alec mencionó que la desintermediación eh, tenía como riesgo un arte más superficial y consumista, pero otros dos intervenientes, dentro de cual vos el último y... Eh, el primero, eh, enfatizaron de la posible y la única oportunidad de vincular arte science con lo espiritual. ¿Podría profundizar un poco sobre este cómo? Bueno, he estado Buenos Aires y veo a mí Almost every wall is covered with some with painting. There must be, you know, two million painters in, in, in Buenos Aires. And they're beautiful. And their gardens are beautiful. And people are painting their houses in a way that is beautiful. I think, it, it, for me, I don't worry too much about the culture industry. I don't really worry that much about uh, technology because I think that we have an instinct towards beauty. Um, uh, if you look at the history of the human species, um, we evolved as a, as a ritual primate. We evolved as a primate that was playing ritual games, that was, um, uh, uh, that, that, that was uh, generating a new generation precisely through um, artistic performance, through inventive artistic performance. Um, uh, you could say that what evolved us uh, was really love songs. That if you, uh, you know, if you sang the right love songs, then you'd have more babies, and those babies would have more of the love song genes. And, uh, uh, and if you could dance well, then you would, uh, there'd be more, you know, would have more dance genes. We are, in a strange kind of way, the way we look is what a whole bunch of apes thought w it would be really cool to look. Um, that we evolved ourselves, we domesticated ourselves. And we domesticated ourselves into this strange game of, of beauty, this ritual of beauty, of dance, of singing, of, of painting on the cave walls, of, of, uh, of pretending to be uh, to acting out the hunt or acting out the Uh, you know the you know the sad love affair. You know that the, 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 this is uh, uh, you know, we're in a sense we're not an authentic species. We're a species that turned ourselves into ourselves through 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 art. I don't have any fear that that's going to go away. We're going to use this. This technology is terrific. You know, let's let's use it. Let's take charge of it. It should belong to us. Um, uh, and I think, you know, that's already, I see that already happening. Uh, the, the, uh, how can I put it? Um, if you think of the, uh, uh, of the, I, I, I'm just so full of admiration for this city. I, I came here partly because this is Jorge Luis Borges' city, and Jorge Luis Borges is God. Um, uh, and uh, 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 it, w what I see is this, you know, terrific modern 
postmodern technology, these fantastic buildings going up and so on. But what I see is a really sound and strong aesthetic instinct that, you know, um, uh, we must rely on that. We, we must celebrate it. Uh, you know, maybe I'm just too optimistic. <laughs> Yeah, I think there are two answers to your question. Um, one is a social one. Imagine you have all this street art, which we can see around the city, and it's fantastic what's happening. And the art critics and gallery owners and institutional collectors would decide what is good and what is bad and remove what they think is good or bad or what could be profitable or not. It's not happening. So that means art is becoming part of the democratic process. And that's going to be uh, even faster and, and uh, more intense with technology, with blockchain, with uh, access to information. And you don't even have to be a trained artist in order to be artist and put a graffiti on the wall. And it may even remain there. Uh, so that means if we go back to the original situation of the cave art 30, 40,000 years ago, probably there was no art critic there around as well. Otherwise, it would have been wiped out or replaced. <laughs> it didn't happen. So we are back to that situation where we are free to produce the art uh, as we wish. And uh, in that sense, that, that's a social development which is very helpful and, uh, and positive. On the spiritual level, I believe that if we reconnect art to the spiritual, uh, make it part of our consciousness development and create our future in a more sustainable way, then the future of art will bring back a certain rediscovery that art is not just the art objects which hang on the wall and have a price and have a certain qualification, uh, it's also about the producer, it's about the artist, it's even the consumer, the owner of the uh, work or the collector. So that means it's about the personality, it's about the development of ourselves. And if we see ourselves as art products and we develop our personality, we develop our spirituality, as we were artists of ourselves, we sculpt our own humanity uh, through an artistic process, then the art objects may be helpful in that process, but it's no longer uh, the most important thing. We are the most important thing. Uh, T.S. Eliot uh, said, uh, where is knowledge? that we have lost to information. And where is wisdom that we have lost to knowledge? And when we speak of uh, spirituality, that spirituality has something to do with this wisdom. And that information is a bit digital. And knowledge is a totality. And totality and bits are divisible. And the wisdom is something to do with wholeness. And wholeness is indivisible. And so long as we remain whole, we remain spiritual. And in, in this modern age, we have lost uh, this connection to wholeness. And so as a philosopher and as a spiritual teacher, uh, one of the things that I'm really concerned about is to move people in the direction from information to knowledge to wholeness, ever increasing wholeness. And one of the ways to define evolution is life's thrust for optimization. And art, science, and technology are three facets of that evolutionary thrust. And because evolutionary thrust is a thrust for optimization, if you are tuned into that optimization thrust, you become optimist. <laughs> and optimist of the present and optimist of the future. And optimists are the, those who optimize 
the moment of now on an ongoing basis. So uh, spirituality has been connected to religion. But in the future, it will be way beyond religion. There's something to do with human consciousness as a whole. And so long as we remain whole in our consciousness, and ongoingly evolve in our wholeness, we will remain spiritual. Now, in that context, you continue to create in the field of art, technology, and science. And so long as we remain this way, we don't get lost in our own creation. And those of you who know Hinduism, there is something called Trimurti, three forms, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And Brahma is the creative phase of cre creation. Vishnu is a pre pres preservation. And Shiva is a creative destruction and transformation. And so long as we remain whole, we remain trimurti. And even if we uh, destroy something, it is in the context of regeneration and new transformation. And when we lose that creative context and get lost in the creation, our own creation, Shiva loses its own divinity and wholeness. And that is what evil is. You know, English word evil is spelled backward, live. Yeah? <laughs> it's a devolutionary force, yes? So, so long as we remain this, in this mode of consciousness, uh, I have uh, great uh, hope, an optimistic view of the future. Yes. Yes. Hello. Uh, my question was for Enrico. Uh, when you were uh, answering the question that he made about the future of art, uh, you suggested that uh, you thought art was going back to that primal and non-commercial um, purpose, you know? And I was thinking, are you suggesting that art will no longer be thought as a commodity in the future? I guess I'm asking this because I'm worried about uh, the artist's financial stability. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't worry. <laughs> As an artist, I think uh, it's your job to create the future. <laughs> and I don't think it's that radical that uh, art will no longer be commercial, but it's not uh, so much in an, ex in an exaggeration uh, as it used to be or it still is partially. So I think it will be complementary uh, in, in that sense that uh, art may also serve a functional purpose uh, that may be to enhance the beauty of an office space. That may be that it will be a decoration of your food. <laughs> uh, there are different possibilities. And as long as there is a function attached to it, there may be also a commercial value. As long as it's ethical, and we are becoming more and more ethical as a society, uh, this is not necessarily that art will completely uh, go away uh, in terms of that trading aspect. Uh, but it may be produced out of a different intention. The intention is not just to become rich and famous. The intention is just to please. Muchas gracias por, por estar y por este espacio también de, que nos ayuda a reflexionar y a pensar. Veo un, un cerebro, un, ¿no? una mastermind <ríe> eh, y con este entorno. Eh, pensaba sobre el año de, de Leonardo y todas las celebraciones y como este actor, este, este artista eh, tan diverso y tan multifacético. Eh, pensaba cómo el, el arte ha impactado en la vida de, de ustedes, por ahí lo que comentaba, en cuanto a, a con, contrarrestar la, la, la hiperespecialización y abrirnos a la curiosidad de, de lo multi de lo multifenoménico, ¿no? de, de todo lo que se nos presenta, eh, que, 
para capturar nuestra atención, abrir nuestra, eh, nuestro interés, conectarnos con, con la realidad de formas nuevas y cómo esto entonces, cómo creen o cómo les ha impactado a ustedes en su propia experiencia, cómo ha impactado el arte eh, en, este, en esta apertura hacia, 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 la, ¿no? hacia, la, hacia un interés genuino por, por, por eso, ¿cómo podría contribuir el arte en un futuro hacia los grandes temas en el sentido de la, de la multidiversidad, de la integración de opuestos y, y de todo esto que como desafío a futuro, ¿no? ¿Cómo creen que el arte podría contribuir en esa, en esa mayor integración de... Creo que el arte es fundamental para nosotros seres humanos. Todos nosotros tendríamos que hacer de alguna forma arte, no tornarnos artistas famosos o vivir del arte, pero sí hacer generar arte. Porque el arte en sí es la expresión, eh, tiene dos componentes. Una es eh, la creación de la belleza y a través del, del contacto con la belleza también nos da un contacto diferente. Eh, y acceso diferente a este mundo terrenal, cotidiano, material. Eh, eh, el otro es la expresión de la belleza y cuando uno se expresa en la belleza también gana otra condición de vida y otro aliento de vida y otra calidad de vida, me parece. Eh, el arte tiene una función primaria para la humanidad que es eh, también la de eh, crear campos de percepción que de otra forma no tendríamos y con estos campos de percepción trascender al, al mundo cotidiano. En mi caso particular, muchos años de industria ejecutivo en el cual usaba mucho mi cabeza, el mundo material, el mundo racional, el mundo, eh, en fin, eh, aceleradamente terrenal, pero luego cuando me dediqué a, a mundo del teatro y hacer actor, bueno, descubrí otro universo y creo que me amplió mucho y me regeneró, claro, también calidades a, a todo lo que hacía, inclusive el mundo de los negocios. Esa es mi, mi percepción. Yo como coleccionista convivo mucho con, con arte y veo en mí, lo vi, pero lo veo en otra gente también, eh, cómo el arte puede transformar transformar de muchas maneras eh, a las personas eh, algo un poco pedestre pero bien directo eh, yo he visto cómo aumenta la productividad de la gente pero por qué la aumenta porque está más contenta la gente porque están más más felices más más alegres da, produce energía genera algo positivo en las personas cuando pusimos eh, porque básicamente no entraba más en casa yo empecé a poner arte en, en la oficina y al principio, el arte contemporáneo, un poco difícil, un poco extraño, eh, las primeras reacciones fueron, ¿qué es esto? ¿No? Y una cosa, cosa casi, casi que te de rechazo. Relativamente rápido después, empezó a generar una dinámica de diálogo con las obras. La gente se quedaba mirando, se quedaba mirando, pasaban y frenaban, camino al baño y miraban un poco. Después diálogo entre las personas. De repente un día les digo, bueno, si quieren saco, ahora yo tengo lugar para... Ni a palos, o sea, todo el mundo estaba feliz con que las obras se quedasen y empezó a generar eso. En mi caso particular, yo he visto cómo la exposición al arte me ha estabilizado, balanceado. Yo trabajo en tecnología, es un mundo incierto, a veces tiene estrés, es hipercompetitivo. Y la, es, el arte nos obliga, nos pone humildes, nos obliga a ser contemplativos, o sea, nos... El arte es el importante, no nosotros, por un, por un rato. Esa experiencia de corrernos del centro de, de lo que está pasando y mirar, observar, aprender, recibir, es sanísima. Y en mi caso, por lo menos, eh, sin duda, me ayuda a funcionar mejor del otro lado. Eh, y, y lo tercero que te diría es, es que une. Eh, no hay muchas cosas en las que, eh, y en nuestro país tristemente esto es particularmente así, la gente está bastante dividida en el mundo, eh, ahí está fracturado, todo el mundo habla del divide, de la grieta, etcétera, etcétera. Sin embargo, el arte une. O sea, la gente puede tener opiniones muy diversas sobre casi todo, 
y enamorarse de la misma pieza de arte y sentirse totalmente identificado con lo que están viendo. Y creo que Arteba es un ejemplo claro de eso. Eh, no es que Arteba es para un pedazo de la grieta o el otro. Todo el mundo entra contento y nadie le pregunta, nadie ni siquiera mete los argumentos que nos dividen. Une. Y eso es importantísimo y creo que va a seguir siendo así a medida que sigamos evolucionando. Um, about transforming one's life, personally, um, my, um, I, I, at 10 years old, I was a little boy who was uh, quite clever and I was a dialectical materialist. <laughs> and um, I was living in Africa at the time, way, way out in the bush, and I was sitting in my uh, father's uh, pickup truck and we were driving through the savannah and one day, one moment, I looked at the leaves of the trees and the, uh, uh, and the, the, the wild plums in the trees and every single leaf, I mean look up at these trees, each, each leaf, you know, if you wanted to build one from scratch, it would take probably a, a three or four billion dollars uh, and 20 years to simply build one of those leaves out of, chem out of chemicals. Everything in the world is, ha is detailed in that way. I mean, we look at the leaves, the leaves are made of cells and the cells are made of molecules and they're made of atoms and so on. It's all so incredibly detailed all the way down. And so I, I had this feeling of utter astonishment. I mean, astonished. And what I've felt ever since then is that any time we're not astonished by the world, by the beauty of the world, we're not really seeing things as they are. <laughs> you know, that, that we ought to be crazy astonished. So um, I think one of the things that art does, because this is also has to do with nature, and we haven't talked much about nature is that our, our artistic process is a continuation of the creative process that evolved all these trees and these leaves and these people and, uh, and the animals and everything. It's a continuation of that process. Um, uh, that we, that, that our art should sort of simply gr grow out of us. And that was, that, that was my uh, uh, transformation and it's been going ever since. Uh, I, I, the, uh, oh, there was something else I wanted to say. Oh, listen to this. Listen, listen to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, maybe I could put it in terms of an aphorism. Poetry is fast evolution. Evolution is slow poetry. In my case, I grew up uh, without art. And when I was 16, I decided I want to have my private room covered with art. And I bought posters from Salvador Dali and put them on wood, uh, wooden panels, and all my room was covered with Salvador Dali pictures. And I started to dream uh, about uh, liquid giraffes and all of that. And I <laughs> think, wow, that's a crazy thing. Um, a bit later, when I earned my first money, uh, and I got a bit more money than I could use for my daily life, I spent everything buying real art, originals, and I had no money left. So art helped me to become crazy <laughs> uh, in a certain sense. And uh, that kind of art I also displayed in my office and clients came and I started to talk about their lives and, and the art and the colors. Uh, and we did very good business and then I started to sell this art as well. <laughs> and I thought, well, so I'm really becoming an entrepreneur. <laughs> thanks uh, to art uh, and uh, 
So the story went on, so I eventually bought the gallery <laughs> and uh, started to do crazy projects with artists. And then I realized it's no longer just the artwork which I'm interested in, it's really the deep relationship with the artists. They have all become good friends, very deep friends. We had extremely intense discussions on philosophy and life, on the good and bad things of life. And uh, art is a communication means, it's a platform just to grow out of yourself and, and just to stay crazy. In philosophy, uh, beauty, truth, and good are three highest values. You can say those are three faces of God. And beauty is truth and good perceived in appearance. Truth is beauty and good conceived in abstraction. And good is beauty and truth achieved through action. And uh, when I was younger, my primary focus was truth. Then I met this beautiful woman. <laughs> And between Buddha and beautiful woman, no brainer. <laughs> and actually, beauty is an emotive cause of love. Love is an emotional reaction to beauty. So this, when you have the reaction to beauty, you have this feeling of in love with the object of beauty. And uh, in 1979, uh, some psychologists from the, from the United States uh, invented the word, Lee May Rance, L-I-M-E-L-E-N-E. -E -E. And she says, this particular uh, psychological state of being in love is universal. So great uh, work of art truly create this, this sense of remembrance, ecstatic resonance with the essence of love that is beauty. So um, uh, we, I think time is, has come, correct? Yes. Um, beside my beautiful wife, um, I love uh, classical music, and then um, like uh, my life has been filled with Beethoven, Bach, Mozart, and those are the primary uh, exposure to beauty in my life, and that will be my answer. Thank you. Um, hi. Thank you to you all for helping us, well, for me, and in, in any case, open our minds today. Can I, can I say one more thing here, in, in closing, for this, uh, this meeting? Yes? Okay. Okay. Should I stand up? Um, yeah, thank you for uh, the inspiration of today's talk and for um, opening our minds. Uh, I began to think of a book by Sebastian Salgado from 2005, which, was, which is in English, The Cradle of Inequality. Mm -hmm. And he considered that technology was not necessarily helping with inequality. And uh, he, he studied, he took photos of schools in Brazil and Peru and Afghanistan and Kenya. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know what you think about that statement today. And I also have three positive things to say. Um, first of all, one of my friends and artist, Nino Kais, last week, it's a little bit like what you said, Alec, in your office. He said that art should um, give the viewer a question, not an answer. And um, I saw a very nice example of something else that was mentioned today, a Brazilian artist from the favela, um, Maxwell Alexander, who is now uh, enjoying great success in the world. And also an exchange between Argentina and Chile of uh, Isabella Crochat, a Chilean gallerist who met a young Argentine artist from the provinces in Munar last year 
and has taken his work to Hong Kong. So this is some examples of um, artists with uh, little means who are doing well. But as a general statement, I wonder what you think about that today, about the inequality and what technology and art can do to uh, make that gap smaller. Yeah, maybe I can answer because I have recently seen the show of Sebastián Salgado in Zurich. Uh, it's still going on. It's an excellent show of black and white uh, photographs of called Genesis Project. Uh, and what struck me most when I saw these pictures and also the film by Wim Wenders, Salt of the Earth, uh, how Salgado works. And he works by immersing himself completely in the situation with indigenous people, with nature, uh, with even very dangerous situations. Of course, he had his camera that worked, but that was never the point. It was really about himself being connected uh, to the situation completely. And out of that, I think he was able to create these very beautiful photographs. And in that sense, technology was there to transport what he wanted to transport, but it was not more than that. It was always at the limit of what was necessary. So in a way, he was very ascetic, uh, technology-wise, uh, just to use technology as far as necessary to what he wanted to achieve. And the main work he did was really to exposing himself as a, as a human being into the situation. And I think this is a, a great example of how to use technology wisely. I'd like to respond to this too. Um, uh, one of the, uh, technology is simply getting better and better and better. And that means that everything is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, which means that there's less and less money value to be extracted from it even as it, covers the, uh, as, uh, as it covers the globe. In many parts of the world, technology has uh, uh, massively increased the equality. I mean, for instance, in China, in, um, uh, in uh, South Korea, uh, many, of the, many countries have been raised up from poverty by technology. But the, 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 the further result is going to be that um, uh, uh, you know, where is the value? Where is value going to come from? I think value is going to come from the kinds of things, all of those soft charm industries. Um, you see on television in the US, and I'm sure it's the same here, you see uh, reality shows that have turned cooking into an art, that have turned interior decoration into, into an art that have turned you know, hairdressing, fashion, into an art. These used to, be, used to be considered as kind of lower things. The real arts were you know, poetry and music and, uh, and so on. Now uh, we're beginning to realize that the creative things that people do for each other you know, they, they, they braid each other's hair and they, uh, you know, they, 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 uh, um, they make beautiful perfumes. They, um, uh, they, they, uh, uh, well, they, s the kids set up mu music groups. Where the money is going to be eventually, I think, is art. Because technology will have made everything else cheap. But art can only be done really by people being creative. So I, I have a feeling that the, that the arc of the economy is going to, is, is going to move towards uh, art actually um, being you know, the, uh, the main source with, I mean, there are, there are some other things. I mean, there's science, which is always, uh, always new. We're always going to have a scientific frontier. Um, there's I think what you might call the moral arts, that is all the arts of, of healing and of looking after people psychologically, the, all of those things are still going to be needed. By the way, that word whole that Yasu, Yasuhiko uses is the same, has the same English root as um, whole, it also holy, and heal, to heal, whole, heal, holy, 
and hale means sort of healthy, and health is the same word too. So all of those arts are also going to survive when technology has made everything else cheap. And, um, and then um, I, I think exploration, and I, mean, I think we're going to go up there, and um, we're going to have wild adventures up there. Um, but, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I, 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 well, as I said, I'm an optimist. <laughs> Ok, eh, no sé si hay alguna última pregunta o comentario eh, para hacerle a este grupo. Sí, gracias. Eh, gracias. Eh, hemos, han, han hablado mucho sobre belleza, eh, pero no sé si el rol principal de arte es logra la belleza. Tiene muchos otros roles. Y no, yo tengo dudas que que uno de sus roles principales es la, es, es la belleza, no sé. No es para provocar y desafiar las, las dogmas y comentar socialmente y políticamente, y, bueno, una lista larga. Es una pregunta, no sé. No sé. Can I respond to this? Because um, this, I think this is very important. But I think what it, the point is it depends what one means by beauty. Uh, you know, uh, if beauty means only pretty, then I think you're right. But if beauty means, um, for instance, the kind of beauty of, uh, of a, uh, you know, a great Greek tragedy, or the kind of beauty that is in, uh, you know, Beethoven, um, uh, we're really talking about... Uh, 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 Beauty as as a making whole. Beauty as uh, as something that makes us see the world more richly and more and more deeply. Um, uh, as scientists, um, uh, for, for any given set of phenomena, scientists could propose an infinite number of possible theories that would cover them. They. They always choose, they always choose the most beautiful theory. And usually it's right. That is, at the bottom of science is beauty. And supposing we think about the moral world, the world of ethics, um, uh, it, it, the, I, I think one of the fundamental ideas in ethics is that is, is, uh, are things which are valuable in themselves. A human being is valuable in herself, right? And that notion of something being value, valuable in itself is central to, to, to beauty. If we talk about being a good person, it means that I do good things for other people. But um, uh, Why do I do things for other people? Because other people are inherently beautiful. They're inherently valuable in themselves. So I think beauty is also fundamental to goodness as well. Um, Chinese sage Lao Tzu said, when beauty is recognized, ugliness arises. When goodness is recognized, evil arises. And in this binary universe. There's always opposite. However, when you study the whole philosophical literature on beauty, they agree on one thing. Real beauty is a coincidence of opposite, a transcendental consilience of paradoxes. So when I talk about beauty, I'm not just talking about the beauty versus ugliness. When, when you see both, There's a way to uh, pursue this in such a way there's a unity beyond this opposite. Uh, in that sense, beauty encompasses so much. Same is true with actually truth and the goodness. So it's an ongoing evolutionary process of your perception. And uh, when you encounter a great uh, a piece of art, which is not just a pretty beautiful or ugly. There's something transcendental to this. And that is also spiritual quality, an evolutionary quality. 
So I agree with you on one level, but on the other level, if you, as he said, expand the concept of beauty in this way, it en encompasses everything. And it is the cause of your love. Now, um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we enjoyed your com uh, company. I just want to say something, one thing. You know, uh, this is a dome, yes? yes. Uh, you know the man named Buckminster Fuller yeah. invented this. Yes. Uh, do you know how Buckminster Fuller defined universe? He defines universe as the aggregate of all humanities consciously apprehended and communicated, partially overlapping, non-simultaneous experiences. Universe is the aggregate of all humanities consciously apprehended and communicated, non-simultaneous, partially overlapping experiences. And each one of us is that experience that makes up this aggregate. And the, each of our experience, each of us is singular, unique. Yes. So we have our singular cosmic destiny to fulfill, and we have the universe as a shared destiny to fulfill. And art is one of the ways to celebrate this singular destiny and shared destiny. Thank you very much.